We're in a series um, called Seeking After God's Own Heart. And it's a series on the life of King David um, in the Old Testament. And um, the fact that there's so much material on David's life in the Bible actually leads us to a temptation, actually, to compress um, various stories into a, a, a short series. Um, and we often miss out the things that perhaps we aren't familiar with and that just consolidate the things that we are more familiar with. So we thought actually a great way of looking at David's life would be to, um, to split up um, all the material over three series, or as the Americans say, seasons. And um, so uh, the three seasons, um, autumn, spring, and summer, um, we um, are now entering the second season of this series. Um, so where are we up to? with a little summary of of David's life so far, um, having had the first section. Well, this is where we are. Uh, 3,000 years ago, the people of Israel, who had had up to that time been led um, under the prophets and judges, under the authority of God who was their king, suddenly desired a king for themselves, much like the nations around them. The problem was that the the king that they really wanted was um, someone with an impressive persona, a strong, a mighty, uh, a physically large person who would come and uh, lead military battles for them. And they got their man, King Saul. The problem was, though, that he was not a man whose heart was for God. He didn't put the nation first, and he certainly didn't seek to lead the nation to, to worship God and to seek God. So God chose someone to replace him. His choice was a shepherd boy, David, who described in Scripture as a man after God's own heart. David would be Saul's replacement. Now, as God providentially worked that situation through, David was actually called to be um, a servant of Saul within his own household. And David ministered to Saul and blessed him. The thing is, though, that the servant became greater than his master. Remember the story of David going out to to meet the Philistines in battle and defeating the Philistine champion, champion, Goliath, um, with just a a stone in a sling. And he showed that he had true faith in God and he became revered by the people. But jealous Saul, desperate to hang on to his power, attempted to kill David who escaped and While seeking to hunt David down, David actually had two opportunities, not just one, but two opportunities to to, to wipe Saul out. But he chose not to do that. He chose to relent, trusting not in his own um, strength, but in God's timing to give him the crown. But where we got to back in November, where we left the story, was that David, in the weariness of running, even David, a man after God's own heart, lost his way. He'd lost his vision. He'd lost his perspective of what God was doing in his life. And don't we all get that? Don't we all get that when we're under pressure, when we go through challenging situations, when our circumstances seem a bit hopeless? Sometimes we feel like we're just surviving. However, God did not let go of David. And God promises never to let go of anyone whose whose faith is in him. The Bible tells us that true faith in God believes that God's love for us was proved by his saving work in sending Jesus. We've just had Christmas, haven't we, where we celebrate Jesus coming into our world. Yes, the baby who was born, but the baby became the man who walked perfectly on earth, demonstrating the love of God through his compassion towards people who needed him or realized their need for him. And his, word and his, his words and his work showed God. But Jesus' mission, his mission was to, bring it to, was, to be, was to bring forgiveness of our sins, the sins and the things that cut us off from God um, and leave us lost forever. Jesus, in his love, went to the cross. He went to the cross to suffer for you and me, to show that the one thing we needed was sin forgiven, Relationship with God restored, and Jesus achieved that for us. He achieved eternity. He achieved the security that we needed from God because his life for our life meant that we could have freedom. 
And it is by trusting this God, the God who went to the cross for us, that we can have complete assurance as we start this new year that God is working for our good at all times. And so through this series, um, Seeking After God's Own Heart, David, great man, though flawed, as we all are, is for us to learn. What does it mean to seek God's heart? I wonder what it might mean for you this year, 2024, to seek a heart after God and to grow in him. Let me just pray for us and we're going to have our Bible reading as we look at our next story in this series. Lord, we just thank you that the life of David was not a smooth journey. He was a man who had your hand upon him. And we know that he had a heart after you. And yet there's so much that we can learn from his life. There's so much that helps us in our faith in Jesus. And so I pray that wherever we're up to right now, that we might be shaped, as that song talked about, shaped by the Father's hand by the love of God, and that we might respond in faith today, but this year, to what you have, the good purposes that you have for us as we trust in you, in Christ, in the cross, and in in the eternity that you've offered us. We thank you, we praise you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'd like to open your Bibles, if you have a Bible there, it'd be great to have it open uh, as we look at our Bible reading. Our our title today is called Weeping and Warring, um, and it's from 2 Samuel chapter 1, so the start of 2 Samuel. Um, We're going to go through actually to uh, verse 11 of chapter 2. We're going to have the words up on the screen as we read the Bible uh, together, Uh, but it's great if you've got your own, have have it open so you can follow the message through afterwards. Rupert's going to come and read that for us now. Thanks, Rupert. Two Samuel chapter one. After the death of Saul, David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed at Ziklag two days. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's camp, with his clothes torn and with dust on his head. When he came to David, he fell to the ground to pay him honor. Where have you come from? David asked him. He answered, I have escaped from the Israelite camp. What happened? David asked. Tell me. He said, the men fled from the battle. Many of them fell and died. And Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. Then David said to the young man who brought him the report, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, the young man said, and there was Saul leaning on his spear with the chariots and riders almost upon him. When he turned round and saw me, he called out to me and I said, what can I do? He asked me, who are you? An Amalekite, I answered. Then he said to me, stand over me and kill me. I am in the throes of death but I'm still alive. So I stood over him and killed him because I knew that after he had fallen, he could not survive. And I took the crown that was on his head and the band on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. Then David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. David said to the young man who brought him the report, Where are you from? I am the son of an alien, 
an Amalekite, he answered. David asked him, Why were you not afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David called one of his men and said, Go, strike him down. So he struck him down and he died. For David had said to him, Your blood be on your own head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan and ordered that the men of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. It is written in the book of Jasher. Your glory, O Israel, lies slain on your heights. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines be glad. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised rejoice. O mountains of Gilboa, may you have neither dew nor rain, nor fields that yield offerings of grain. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul no longer rubbed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the flesh of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back. The sword of Saul did not return unsatisfied. Saul and Jonathan, in, lo- in life they were loved and gracious, and in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and finery, who adorned your garments with ornaments of gold. How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. How the mighty have fallen. The weapons of war have perished. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? He asked. The Lord said, Go up. David asked, Where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. So David went up there with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmen. David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron and its towns. Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. When David was told that it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who had buried Saul, he sent messages to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, The Lord bless you for showing this kindness to Saul, your master, by burying him. May the Lord now show you kindness and faithfulness, and I too will show you the same favor because you have done this. Now then, be strong and brave, for Saul, your master, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Meanwhile, Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. He made him king over Gilead, Ashuri, and Jezreel, and also over Ephraim, Benjamin, and all Israel. Ishbosheth, son of Saul, was 40 years old when he became king of Israel, and he reigned two years. The house of Judah, however, followed David. The length of time David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. And also 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. The war between the house of Saul and the house of David 
lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Thanks, Rupert. Let's just pray together, and let's uh, see what God wants to say to us through these words. Thank you, Father, that as we learn what it means to seek after your own heart, please speak to us through this story, through David's experience, uh, through our own experience. Uh, would your spirit be stirring us uh, by faith today to seek Jesus and his purposes for our lives? So we ask for your help now and for ears to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder if and how you celebrated New Year's Eve. That's a thing for you. We, we met here, actually, last Sunday. Uh, we had lunch instead of a, a morning service to, to celebrate the year past, to thank God for what he'd been doing in our lives, but also to, to seek him for the year ahead, for, for us personally, for us as a church. I um, don't know if uh, you ever look at the uh, big fireworks display that they have in London. I know uh, people might have fireworks, you know, just in their houses at uh, New Year, but massive, massive firework display. It must cost thousands of pounds. And uh, the idea is it's meant to be a, a huge celebration, isn't it, of, of what has happened over the past year and how we might look forward in hope. Um, it's the idea that a new year brings hope and opportunity, new possibilities for the year ahead. But you look at the lights lighting up the sky, and all you've got to do is turn on the news to see a different load of lights. When we see gunfire uh, and warfare, that doesn't seem to cease. There's, there's wars happening in our world when we, we see that it's nearly two years now, isn't it, since the Russian invasion of U Ukraine. The conflict between Israel and Hamas looks like continuing. There's no sign of that ceasing. It's not going to be resolved soon. So we see, don't we, that, that uh, even in a new year, there's war and conflict going on in the world around us. But actually, we can also look inside our own hearts and see the conflict that's going on within us. When we look inside us, we, we recognize the struggle that we have to conquer our own sin. Maybe the old habits in our lives or our flawed characters that seem to still have a grip on us. And we might wonder, even as we start the new year, what's going to change in my own life? I keep making the same mistakes. So the start of the new year, whilst you know, in what the world wants to sort of portray it as, a, as an opportunity for hope and new possibilities, actually it can bring despair to us when we think, wow, there's so much that's wrong in life. Now, we hold a prayer and fasting week at the beginning of each year for a specific purpose. We do it because we think at the beginning of the year it's really important to seek the Lord for transformation and change, both in the world around us, where we want to see his kingdom come, but also in our own lives. The things that we want to bring before God to say, Lord, please, I need your help in my life, to bring that change, that transformation, to make me more like Christ. It's not in our own strength, but it's seeking God and his power. And as we left the story of David back in November, the end of season one, David, David, the anointed one by God to be the great king of Israel, had lost his way. He'd been on the run been on the run from the outgoing King Saul for so long that his hope had waned and he was in survival mode. We know what that's like, don't we? To struggle and to suffer and to, to just be getting by. But David, in, in that state of mind, in that state of being, he walked this sort of thin line. He became a desert raider, pretending to serve the Philistine king, Achish, trying to, 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 to find favor with him and yet not give himself completely over to him. But the problem was, David got himself in hot water. Got himself in trouble. He felt compromised. 
Things became a mess. We know what that's like, don't we? When we start to give ourselves over to the world. But David remembered God. There was a point when everything seemed lost. Everything seemed hopeless. And yet David at that point was stirred to remember God. And as David turned back to him, God helped David. God showed, God was faithful all the time, but, but was wanting David to have his eyes opened and to recognize that God was there. And God helped David to overcome an Amalekite army that had raided his town. And David's perspective turned back onto God and what God was doing in his life rather than just seeing with worldly wisdom. And so David got his life back on track. But the thing is, as you know and as I know, uh, David's story, as it is true in our own life story, uh, life is not smooth. Even when we get our eyes on God, <laughs> life continues to be tricky and challenging. It's not smooth along the way. And I, I wonder if for you, as you've reflected back over this past year about the bumps in the road, what the challenges have been like for you in this past year? And what has that mean, meant for your faith? How have you been tested? The thing is, just because we face challenges, it does not mean that God is not there in it. It does not mean that God is not good and God doesn't have a good purpose for what's happening. Often it's a case of us having the perspective and having our eyes open, our eyes of faith open to see what God is doing. Because so often we can look around and come to the wrong conclusions. So God is at work, even through the challenges. And so this was what lay before David, to have eyes of faith. It's exactly what Jesus had to do, have the eyes of faith as he came to earth and sought to serve his Father's will in accomplishing his mission under pressure with temptations to turn away from his task. But it's the same for us now as, as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus. With all that lays before us, would we have the eyes of faith to see what God is doing? And we're going to see three things from this story today. Three things, how three things are or how three things happen in God's world. You'll see that from the titles. And um, we start with the first one. How the mighty have fallen. So we pick up the story today with a significant development in the life of David. The significant development was this. King Saul was dead. Now I wonder where you were, if you remember where you were when you heard the news of Queen Elizabeth's death. Uh, nearly 18 months ago now, wasn't it? On the Wednesday evening, she was taken unwell, and by the following day, she'd passed away. We all knew that the time would come where she would die and she would no longer be with us, but it seemed that she would last forever. It seemed like it, didn't it? When it happened, we were stunned. Many of us were stunned. It's like time stood still. The next day after the day she died was my Sabbath day, my rest day, and it was so strange reflecting on her life with her no longer being on the earth. And let's look at the story here, uh, 2 Samuel 1, verse 1. Have a look at it in your Bible. Uh, the story tells us, after the death of Saul, David returned from striking down the Amalites, uh, Amalekites and stayed in Ziklag two days. Ziklag was the town that David had made his home. Now David, at this point, didn't yet know that King Saul was dead. But we do, if we've read the story um, from the end of 1 Samuel, chapter 31, it's, there's an account of what happened. Uh, Saul and his army were engaged in battle against the Philistines. Uh, three of Saul's sons were, were killed, including David's best friend in the whole wide world, Jonathan. We looked at the, the, the David's friendship with him, didn't we, before Christmas. And Saul was fatally wounded, not dead, but fatally wounded, and rather than be found by the enemy troops and then be finished off by them, he couldn't bear the thought that they would take pleasure in seeing him die. Um, and he, he turned to his armor bearer and asked that, for his armor bearer to kill him. The armor bearer could not bear to do it. And so Saul himself fell on his own sword. 
um, at which point the armor bearer did the same. They both died. And so it was a bloody end to a conflicted life. Saul was battling, always battling, but ultimately was not fighting for the Lord's cause. Sad end. But to David, the news of Saul's death came from an unlikely source. Have a look at verse uh, 13. Um, We see that the news that is brought to David is is from the son of a foreigner, an, an Amalekite. Now, Amalekites ordinarily were enemies. We know that don't we, that we see the, the, the fights and the battles against the Amalekite enemies. But this man's family had, must, have been, must have become part of the Israelite society. Um, and so he, he tells David his account of what happened at Saul's death. And the, the details of his story are dubious. In reporting Saul's death, um, it complete, completely conflicts with the details recorded in the previous chapter. This man, this Amalekite, had claimed that Saul had asked him to kill him. Whereas in 1 Samuel 31, this man is not mentioned at all. In fact, Saul had asked the armor bearer, hadn't he, to kill him. Um, And Saul ends up falling on his own sword when the armor bearer was unwilling. So the truth is that this Amalekite actually had found Saul dead already. He took his crown and his armband in the hope that in finding David, he could win favor and hopefully a reward from him. He thought that David, knowing something of what was going on, would be pleased at Saul's death. David would think, now is the time for me to become king. And David would be pleased with this man coming with this news. But David's response was the complete opposite. Look at verses 11 and 12. It says, David and all the men with him took hold of their clothes and they tore them. They mourned and wept and fasted. Fasted? Yeah, we just had a prayer and fasting week. Fasting with mourning over death was a common thing. Uh, Wept and fasted till evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the army of the Lord and for the nation of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. During this whole period, years of waiting for God to bring about his promise to David to make him king, David never wanted to seize the throne through his own desire or self-serving means. He didn't want to do it that way. He was trusting in God's timing and he, he could not take pleasure in someone else seemingly doing the same, taking things into their own hands. And so ironically, this a Malachite chancer was punished for the thing he claimed to do and yet didn't do. David said in verse 16, your, the, your blood be on your own head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. And David lamented and he wrote a song. We see in the Psalms some laments, don't we? Uh, but we, we, we see this lament that he wrote, verse 17 and 18. David took up this lament concerning Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered that, that the people of Judah be taught this lament of the bow. And there's this um, refrain that goes through this, this, this song, this lament, um, this crying out. And he's, this, this phrase David continually repeats, how the mighty have fallen. Now, more often than not, we, you know, we, we, have that, we sometimes use that phrase now, don't we? And more often than not, it's a, a victorious phrase or a smug remark when we think of a once mighty or great leader that's, that's been toppled. They've come to their demise, and we, we seem to take pleasure in using that phrase, oh, how the mighty have fallen. And yet for David, it's a phrase of genuine grief. Yes, he was particularly grieved for his best friend, Jonathan, his his best friend in life. Verse 26, my brother, you were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. By the way, that's nothing. There's no hint there of any sort of homosexuality, right? That That was a friendship thing. Talking about the faithfulness of his very best friend. So yes, David was grieving Jonathan more than anyone. 
But there was also a genuine mourning for Saul's passing. David knew that Saul had been a jealous and a misguided king, and yet he somehow had an affection for him and still revered him as the man God had installed as king. And David, in this lament, he reflected on on Saul and Jonathan's accomplishments on the battlefield and how they blessed the nation still. Just before Christmas, uh, I, um, I came across a really interesting interview with, with um, Bradley Wiggins um, on the BBC. Um, Bradley Wiggins, one of the most successful um, competitive cyclists that our nation's ever produced. Um, five Olympic gold medals, uh, Tour de France trophy, incredible athlete in his career. And yet many people didn't know at the time, but, but are now becoming aware through some of his interviews of an awful relationship that he had with his father. His, his own dad, who walked, on, who walked out on him when he was a baby, a young child, um, uh, later on came back into his life when, when Wiggins was a, a, a successful cyclist. But his dad was, was hugely jealous of Bradley Wiggins' success um, and, his, and his gifts. And, uh, and Wiggins talks about that jealousy that just drove such a huge wedge between them and has haunted him ever since. And that relationship has never, up to this point, not been restored. And you, you can think that, that Saul's jealousy of David in, in, in David's life, you can imagine that, that David at Saul's death would be overjoyed at Saul's demise. And yet David could not delight in Saul's death. Not one bit. And in that sense, David was reflecting the heart of God. What's this series all about? It's seeking after God's own heart. How can we be more like God in our lives? How how might he transform us to become more like him? And in the book of Ezekiel, God says this. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will take no pleasure in the death of the wicked but rather that they turn from their ways and live. God is a God of justice, right? God had to judge Saul for his disobedience. God will judge all evil, evil, all evil rulers in our age, evil, the evilness within the hearts of every person. There's sin in each of us. That there must be judgment for, for sin. And yet God doesn't delight in that. He delights in justice. He is a God of justice. But he doesn't delight in people going to hell. God doesn't take pleasure in that. But what did he do? God sent his son Jesus Christ to earth to face the judgment of God. This is what many of our our worship songs sing about because it's central to the Christian faith. It's it's central to the lives of all those who have turned to Christ. We say, praise God for sending Jesus, who was judged instead of me. That justice could be done for sin. And yet freedom can be had for the sinner. Isn't that great news? This is good and pleases God, our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. It's God's desire for anyone, everyone to turn to Jesus. God doesn't take delight in judgment, but he is a a God of justice. How might we be more like him? How might we be more like David in our response to wicked and evil in the world? How the mighty have fallen? How might we use that phrase in a godly sense in our lives? So how the mighty have fallen, King Saul was dead. But but as we move on in the story, we see this. How the schemes of man continue. Because we know it, don't we? Even from our lives and our existence, or even if we read history, as soon as one evil regime is wiped out, there will always be another willing to take its place. That's not to say that we shouldn't strive for justice in the world. It's just that we know that it will not be complete in this life until Jesus returns. In our story, we know that David had now turned a corner and was prepared to leave Philistine country where he was compromised in his life and return and head back to the land and the people God promised that he would be ruler over. 
We're into chapter 2 now. Uh, Have a look at chapter 2. When David sought God, in response to God's directing of him, David settled in Hebron. And in verse 4 we read this, The men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the tribe of Judah. You think of the many years that had passed since David was anointed by Samuel to become king and all that had happened. David's running from Saul and his hiding. David's exile and his doubting. Those things were over now. He'd returned and he was anointed king. But hold on. Hold on. Look at verses 8 and 9. It says, Meanwhile... Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim and made him king over Gilead, Ashurai, Jezreel, Ephraim, Benjamin, and over all Israel. Hold on, what have we got going on here? We've got two kings attempting to rule the nation. And what we find in the next few chapters in 2 Samuel is a bloody conflict between the house of Saul, led by Abner, commander of his army, and the house of David, led by his commander, Joab. We see that summarized in chapter 3, verse 1. That's why Rupert read that at the end of our reading there. It says, The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. It'd be a good idea, actually, before next week, because we're in 2, 2 Samuel 5 next week, read chapters 2 to 4 for yourself, and you'll see it. I refer to it here, but you'll see the plotting and the deceit and the killing that, two, that took place as the two sides struggled amongst each other. We see Abner, who knew that David was to be king. He knew it full well, but sought to strengthen his own position by installing Ishbosheth as he bucked against God's plan. David lamented at the way that Joab, the commander of his own army, went about trying to enact his own sense of justice by taking out Abner. He killed Abner. As well as the way that two of Ishbosheth's own men killed him, claiming to serve David's purposes. And what we see in those chapters is very much the way of the world. It's the way of the world while People scheme in their own hearts using their own wisdom and, and, and pushed by their own desires to follow their own hearts. That's how the world seems to be working. It's, it's, how, it's how things go. The schemes of evil men. But we know that, don't we, as we look in the pages of the New Testament, that the schemes of evil man as they plotted was enough to put Jesus on the cross. And as David... Um, grieved that these things were happening around him, but he sought to continue to trust in God's plans and purposes, we must remember that despite the people's struggles in the world today, despite those who are led by their own desires to bring about their own purposes, we have a God who has not lost control. And how do we know? How can we be sure that we have a God who is in charge All we have to do is look at the cross. Because the schemes of man that put Jesus on the cross resulted in what? The salvation of the world. Because when Jesus died, he was not defeated by those who wanted to get rid of him. But he gained the victory over sin. And Jesus would rise from the dead to rise to eternal life and offer life for all of us when we turn to him. And my encouragement today is this. You may be a Christian. Keep your eyes on the cross if you want to know God's power and God's control. You may not yet be a believer. And when you see the world around you and you might despair or wonder where the world's going, I encourage you, look at the cross. Turn to Christ because salvation is there for you. And you can enjoy God for eternity. The song we sang earlier, 
had these words in. God, our fortress and our strength, the rock on which we can depend, matchless in his majesty, his power and authority, unshaken by what? The schemes of man. They continue, but God is unshaken by them. Never changing, great I am. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Don't we know it? But he is faithful through it all. Crown him king forevermore. We sang that earlier. And in a few moments' time, we're going to sing this song. <laughs> in Christ alone, my hope is found. And you can sing it with all your heart if you believe it, because these words are true. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here, in the power of Christ, I'll stand. So yes, how does the world work? The schemes of man continue, but they will not prevail. The cross is won. God is in charge. Amen? I like some amens. First Sunday of the year. But let's end with this as we think about David's story and how it relates to us. What's the third thing? How the kingdom grows. Turn back with me to just chapter 2, verse 4. Reflect on this again, where it says that the men of Judah came to Hebron and there they anointed David king over the tribe of Judah. God had directed David to Hebron. The people there recognized, recognized David's right to be crowned king. After all the waiting, all the preparing, all the trials, there was a tangible outcome. David was a king but it was only over one tribe. Ishbosheth was king over the other 11, the nation of Israel. So what does this tell us? Well, I think that David's story foreshadows the story of Jesus when he came into the world. When Jesus began his ministry, um, he uttered these words. He proclaimed, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. When he proclaimed that the kingdom of God had come and people started to recognize Jesus as the Messiah that they'd been waiting for, many believed that Jesus would sweep, suddenly sweep in a new societal age of prosperity for the nation of Israel, freedom and liberty, strength and greatness. But Jesus also said, he went on to say something else very significant about the kingdom of God. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. A mustard seed that is so small, you have to enlarge the picture <laughs> to see it on the tip of the finger. It's so small. And yet the mustard seed grows to become the biggest, one of the largest garden plants the point that Jesus was making was that the kingdom of God would start small and seem insignificant to many and yet would grow to become something of huge, huge significance for the world. In Jesus' earthly ministry, whilst there was much fascination over people that came across him, most, many people completely missed who he really was. Let me tell you a little story. In Washington, D.C., there was a metro, state in a, a metro station on a cold January morning in 2007. This man, with his violin, played six bark pieces of music for 45 minutes. During that time, approximately 2,000 people went through the station, most of them on their way to work, and people were too busy to stop, uh, to listen, to notice it took about seven minutes before the violinist uh, received his first dollar. A woman threw some money in the hat but didn't have time to stop and wait. She carried on on her way. One or two people stopped briefly, uh, looked at their watches, started on their way. Occasionally children slowed down but they were tugged by their parents who were hurriedly walking along. The musician played continuously. Only six, six people stopped and listened for a short while. About 20 gave money. And at the end, as the man counted up what he'd received, he was given $32. When he finished playing, no one noticed and no one applauded. And there was really no recognition at all. 
And no one knew this, but this violinist was Joshua Bell. I don't know if you're a musician, but he's one of the, he is one of the greatest musicians in the world. He was playing one of the most intricate pieces ever written, and his violin, that violin that he was, he was playing, was worth three and a half million dollars. Two days before that, that's why I showed two pictures next to each other, two days prior to that event, Joshua Bell was playing in a sold-out theater in Boston where the seats um, averaged $100 each to listen to exactly the same music that Joshua Bell was playing in that metro station in Washington, D.C. Here's the point. Many people, many of us, many people can miss something significant right before their eyes. Many people miss the identity, mission, and accomplishments of Jesus Christ. Many people missed who Jesus was when he walked on the earth. So many people today would say, if I saw him, I'd believe. Yeah, how many people didn't accept him even then? And even though millions of people since Jesus came to earth have turned to him by faith, maybe you're discouraged about how so many people still don't. Lots of people would say it's foolishness to place your life in the hands of someone who purportedly died on a cross. What's that all about? And yet those who recognize what the cross accomplished, who have turned to Jesus by faith, can say with certainty, the cross is the power of God to save my life and give me eternity. Surely and slowly, or slowly and surely, the kingdom of God is growing in God's way, in God's time. And one day, there will be absolutely no doubt across the world who Jesus is, the fact that he is the king forevermore. And one day everyone will bow, either willingly or forcibly, to acknowledge Jesus as the king over all. And this week in our prayer and fasting week, as we spent some time you know, those who, who gathered to meet, we prayed the Lord's Prayer together. Slowly, with pauses between each section, each line, to really allow the significance of the words to dwell in us. It meant that we could pray it rather than just say it. What words these are, and how true they will be when Jesus returns. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we start this year, I want you to praise God. He is the king. And thank him that his purposes will be fulfilled. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that... Whilst there is weeping and warring in the world, whilst the schemes of man, sometimes we wonder if the schemes of man will prevail, we have the assurance that God is in control, that, that the cross where the schemes of man plotted to wipe out Christ simply achieved the purposes of God to bring forgiveness for sin. Help us today to renew our faith in Jesus and to trust him with our lives, to recognize his glory and authority, his love and compassion for us. Thank you for what we're learning through David's life and we praise you for what you're doing in ours. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.